If you have your Bibles, why don't you go ahead and turn to the book of Habakkuk. Turn to Habakkuk chapter 1. I realize that some of you might need to turn to the table of contents and then to Habakkuk. It's totally okay. I'm not going to be offended by that if you take the time to do that. Uh, But let's turn to Habakkuk chapter 1. And uh, I want to see what God's Word has to say about a really important topic. uh, And a topic that has to do with apologetics. I think a topic that really more has to do with our faith. And how we have faith in a, in a living, holy, loving, sovereign God in the midst of a world of suffering. So, Habakkuk chapter 1 is where we'll be. We're going to consider chapters 1 and 2 in our time together. We'll, we'll summarize them. We're not going to get into all the details. But I want to look at these two chapters and what they have to say about a very relevant issue. So let's read it together. This is the Word of God. Habakkuk 1, we'll start in verse 1. The Word of God reads, The oracle which Habakkuk the prophet beheld. How long, O Yahweh, will I call for help, and you will not hear? I cry out to you, violence, yet you do not save. Why do you make me see wickedness and cause me to look on trouble? Indeed, devastation and violence are before me, and there is strife and contention is lifted up. Therefore, the law is ignored, and justice never comes forth, for the wicked surround the righteous. Therefore, justice comes forth perverted. This is God's very word. Let's pray as we think about it together this morning. Heavenly Father, your word tells us that your throne is in the heavens and the earth is but your footstool. You are far greater than us, Lord. You don't need us. Lord, we constantly, consistently, desperately, dependently need you. But we offer you nothing that you need from us. And yet there is one to whom you'll look. The one who is humble and contrite in spirit and who trembles at your word. Lord, help us to be gripped by your word this morning. Help us to be humbled by it. Help us to be broken over our own sin and our own weakness and to trust in you and what your word shows us about your character. Father, we pray that by your Holy Spirit you would help me to preach this sermon now. Help us to listen well, that we might behold you and live faithfully in this world. Pray this in your son's name. Amen. One of the things I'm thankful for about the Bible is how well the Bible knows us. It's a book that has history. It's a book that has poetry. It's a book that has doctrine. But it's a book that speaks to us, that understands the human condition and addresses the regular needs of our life. The Bible speaks to our biggest needs. It addresses our biggest questions. It explains our biggest problems. And we shouldn't be surprised by that. That's what Scripture tells us. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says, All Scripture is God-breathed. It is profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, and training in righteousness. Right? The man of God might be complete. It tells us the Word would help us be complete. Psalm 19, 7 says, The testimony of Yahweh is sure, making wise the simple. So we get... The Bible should be a very practical book. It tells us it would be. We expect this from the Word of God. But this morning, I want to address an issue that the Bible addresses that many state as the reason for why they don't believe the Bible or why they don't believe the gospel. There are several reasons people will give. They'll say, how can there only be one true religion? I mean, all of us ultimately make truth claims. How can you say your truth claim is better? Others will say, well, what about those who have never heard of the gospel before? How can God be fair if there's people who've never heard the truth? So it's an interesting issue. Romans 1 addresses that. Uh, others will say, well, what about the evil done in the name of religion? How can religion be true? Well, I would say the evil done in the name of atheism doesn't necessarily provide a better comfort. But perhaps one of the, the most common arguments you'll hear expressed in the media, expressed from people you know, maybe even expressed in your own heart is how can there be a holy, loving, sovereign God 
And yet there's so much evil in this world. I mean, there's so much justice and wickedness that goes undeterred, unstopped. If God is holy, then why is wickedness allowed to thrive? I mean, here's how the argument goes. The Bible says God is good, God is sovereign, God is loving. And then we see evil in the world, which then the response is, well, either God isn't as loving because he allows it to happen, or he isn't as powerful because he can't stop it. But either way, then the God of the Bible doesn't exist. C.S. Lewis described the problem like this. If God were good, he would wish to make his creatures perfectly happy. And if God were almighty, he would be able to do what he wished. But the creatures are not happy. Therefore, God lacks either goodness or power or both. It's a compelling argument. It's an important issue for us to address. And it's exactly the issue we find here in Habakkuk. Let's wrestle with this problem. Habakkuk is wrestling with the problem of a sovereign God and the righteous suffering. That's what he's dealing with. And rather than ignoring these issues as Christians, we want to take them head on. We want to understand, okay, does this book speak to every single issue? And God is still glorious and holy and great. And I hope to show you in these two chapters today that he does. We're going to look at these chapters in four parts. And it's really a discussion that's going on. We're going to see Habakkuk talk to God. We're going to see God talk back to Habakkuk. Habakkuk's going to talk again, and God's going to give his final answer. Four parts, and I'll sort of repeat the points of the conversation as we go along if you're taking notes. So here's number one if you're a note taker. Number one, I want you to see Habakkuk's great concern. Habakkuk's great concern. And now Habakkuk is writing right around 600 BC. This is before the fall of Jerusalem. I can explain the, the dating of that later if you've got questions about that. But Jerusalem has not been destroyed yet. But we learn a lot about the setting from the language. Uh, this is an oracle. It might be uh, verse 1. It might be translated burden, which means this is a message of judgment. There's judgment that Habakkuk is going to be expressing in this prophecy. And he cries out, how long, O Yahweh? Until when? He says, I, I cry for you for help, but you do not hear. We understand that. We've been in those situations before where we're praying and there's no relief. But Habakkuk's concern, it tells us in verse 2, is about stuff that's happening in his society. He says, I cry out to you, violence, and you do not save. Lord, there are people being oppressed around me. There are, are wicked people doing horrific things to others. And I cry out to you, Lord, there's violence everywhere. You don't do anything about it. I don't see you acting. Verse 3, he says, why do you make me see wickedness? I mean, see the language there. He's saying, God, you are the one who's making me see this. You're causing me to see this around me, and yet you do nothing. You, you cause me to look on trouble. There's strife and contention that's lifted up. That's what Habakkuk is seeing. Now, you might think, oh, man. I mean, Habakkuk must be living in downtown L.A., right? I mean, that is where, that's where the bad stuff's happening. Or you mentioned we're trying to plant a church in Long Beach. It's like, oh, yeah, that's, that's, where, Habakkuk, well, that's where Habakkuk was, Long Beach, because there's, there's trouble down there. There's trouble in Long Beach. That's where we're planting a church there. It's going to be awesome. Um, you might be thinking, this is happening in some really bad place. It's not. It's not happening in some pagan land. He's, he's prophesying from Jerusalem. These are God's people. Uh, the people that were supposed to follow God's law. The people that were supposed to be a royal priesthood that represented God to the world. The people that were supposed to be holy because they belonged to a God that was holy. And what does he see? He says, therefore, the law, verse 1, is ignored. There is no justice. The wicked surround the righteous every day. He's saying there is something wrong with my world as evil is being done to the innocent. God, there are innocent people and horrific things are done to them and you do nothing. And so we begin to see this is not, uh, this is not a 2,500 year old issue. You begin to see the relevance of this book. 
This has to do with some of the same things we see today. The same news stories we see today. Uh, this is about what happened in Uvalde over a year ago. This is what happened in, in Louisville a month ago. This is about nations invading other nations and countless thousands of people are slaughtered. This is about Stephen Paddock on the 32nd floor of the Mandalay Bay gunning down 60. This is about all sorts of private acts of wickedness done to women, done to children, done every single day. This is about those who claim to be Christians and sing really loudly on Sunday, who do awful things in secret midweek. And we sit back and we wonder, where is God? I mean, the news loves these stories. They put them up there and say, man, how bad is this? But they love them because it gives them material. It gets more clicks, more views, more viewers. How could God allow this to happen? And so there's all sorts of responses. People will mock and say, oh man, looks like we might need some more thoughts and prayers. That'll really help the situation. Or people start trying to figure out the evil. Oh, you know what? This happened because of lack of gun control. Or this happened because we need more guns going on. Or this happened because look at the pronouns in the person's bio that did this thing. Or this happened because we did it. And on and on and on it goes. And we give all these opinions on how we're supposed to solve these things. Despite the fact we find ourselves utterly unable to do so. And so what should we do? Well, we should do what Habakkuk does. See, Habakkuk here, you might sense that he's complaining. And, and you, you might see some complaining here, but I don't think he's complaining in the sinful sense. Because what he's doing is what we should all do when this happens. His, he's taking his concern to God. He doesn't go online. He doesn't complain to others. I mean, I guess he didn't have internet, but I don't think he would have anyway. He's taking his concern to God. And he's bringing it up to God and saying, Lord, help me figure this out. And so when this happens in our own lives privately, or when we see things happening in the public eye, we ought to do the same thing. And the good news is, when we take this concern to God, we don't get silence, we don't get speculation, we get answers. So point number two, let's look at Yahweh's unbelievable response. Yahweh's unbelievable response. This will be verses 5 to 11. Read verse 5. It says, see among the nations and look. Be also astonished. Be astounded. Because I am doing something in your days. You would not believe it if it was recounted to you. Now this verse brings up just as a side note, just a good practice in interpreting the Bible. Whenever we're interpreting the Bible, we should always consider the context around it. Because right? there's all sorts of really weird verses that you can come up with that if you ignore the context, you could say weird stuff. Like in sports, you're running fast. And you're telling your teammate, hey guys, let's keep working hard. Remember, Jesus said, what you do, do quickly. You know, that's again, don't, don't use that verse. It's not helpful to use that one out of context. And this one is one of those that gets used out of context. Where people say like, man, financially, Things are just going rough for us, and we need to get a house. And someone says, hey, don't worry. God's about to do something so amazing. You wouldn't believe if he told you. Or some of you here, after your fourth year of striking out on trying to find a lady friend, and your friends come to you, and they say, don't worry, bud. God's going to do something in your life so amazing. We're not even going to believe it when it happens. No, I'm just kidding. Anyway. <laughs> No, that's, that's not the way to use this verse. The, the way to use this verse is to consider the context of what he says next. And so what does God say? He says, be amazed, be astonished. I'm doing something in your days. You would not believe it if I recount it to you. For behold, I am raising up the Chaldeans. There we go, Habakkuk, I hear you, I get it. Israel's wicked, but I'm gonna tell you something amazing. I'm bringing the Babylonians to judge. That's what God says. He says, it's okay. I'm going to bring the Chal I'm not. I'm not ignoring this. I am seeing this. I am acting. And I'm going to raise the Chaldeans to come and wreak havoc on the nation of Israel. This is the Babylonian war machine coming to conquer. And this is devastating news. Because God then goes into the explanation of the power 
and the destruction that is coming from Babylon. Verse 6, he says, That bitter and hasty nation who walks on the breadth of the land to possess dwelling places that are not theirs. Uh, he says, this is a nation that's a bully on the block. That ever since they, they defeated the Assyrians uh, around 16, or 612 BC, this is the nation that's now conquering the other nations in the area. And God is saying, they are coming. Look at it, verse seven. He says, they are dreaded and feared. Their justice and exaltation comes forth from themselves. He says, they thrive in violence and their justice is martial law. Their justice is only the strong survive. Their justice is whoever wins the fight gets to make the rules. That's who's coming right here. Oh, what the text highlighting is, is highlighting here is the fierceness of the Chaldeans. And why are they to be feared? Well, verse eight, they're swift and they're strong. Their horses are swifter than leopards and sharper than wolves in the evenings. Their horsemen come galloping. Their horsemen come from afar. They fly like an eagle swooping down to devour. He's describing their military strength. What he's saying is they come quickly and when they come, you better watch out because you can not stop them. The damage is gonna be on a massive scale, verse nine. All of them come for violence. Their horde of faces moves forward. They gather captives like sand. He says you can't resist them, verse 10. They mock at kings, and rulers are a laughing matter to them. They laugh at every fortress and heap up dirt and capture it. And then he says they're coming for you. They will sweep through like the wind and pass on. They will be held guilty. They whose power is their God. God knows who the Chaldeans are. When he says their power is their God, I mean, that is a reference to their idolatry. These are people who idolized their military strength and they loved their false gods because they believed their false gods gave them their strength. God's aware of who they are and he says they're coming. So again, let's recap the story. Part one, Habakkuk said, Israel has, has wickedness everywhere. The wicked surround the righteous. Part two, God says, I understand. That's why I'm bringing the Babylonians to judge them. Now, before we move on, I want you to notice something about this section here, verses five to 11. This is not merely a prediction. Okay, this is a prediction. God is saying the Chaldeans are coming. Judgment is coming. He knows the beginning from the end. This is going to happen. But notice what he says, verse five. He says, I am doing something in your days. Do we realize this? God is saying this is happening because I'm doing it. I'm sovereign over it. I, I don't, I'm not just telling you how it's going down. I'm telling you what I'm doing as the Babylonians are coming. And this gives us a lesson as we look at evil, not only on a personal scale or a community scale, but on an international scale, that all kings are under the authority of Yahweh, the one true king, that God rules over all the nations. Proverbs 21.1 says, the king's heart is a stream of water in the hand of the Lord, and he turns it wherever he wills. That all kings with their desires, with their powers, with their selfishness, their heart is in God's hand. And if he wants to kind of direct it one way or direct it another way, he can because he reigns. All, all, all international rule, all leadership falls under his reign, serving his purposes, even warfare. Listen to Isaiah 526. Isaiah 526, it says, he, speaking of God, will raise a signal for nations far away and whistle for them from the ends of the earth. And behold, quickly, speedily they come. You notice that when God wants to judge other nations, he can just use different nations to judge them. And what does he do? He just, he whistles for them. Come here, I need you to do this. Reminds me of in 1 Samuel 23, when Saul is about to capture David, and there, it's this epic scene where it's like David's on one side, Saul's on the other side, and there's this epic chase down. All of a sudden it says, Saul gets a note that the Philistines had come to attack, and so Saul has to pull back, and David was rescued. How did that happen? Random chance? No. Because God 
whistles and the nations do his bidding. Exodus 9, 15, and 16 tell us that God could have easily wiped out Pharaoh in one plague. You realize that, right? God didn't need 10 plagues. He didn't need to like chip away at Egypt. You know, like he could have just wiped, he could just sent like massive frogs the first time, eat all the Egyptians, it would have been gnarly. He could have done that, but he didn't. Why? Because nations serve his purposes. And his purpose there, he tells them, Exodus 9, 15, he says, for by now I could have put my hand and struck you and your people with pestilence, and you would have been cut off from the earth. But for this purpose, I have raised you up to show my power so that my name may be proclaimed in all the earth. There we go. If God wants to use the most powerful nation at that time as theater to display his greatness, he can, and he does. He calls Cyrus, uh, the king of Persia, his shepherd in Isaiah 44. This is a God who rules over all things. And there is not a king who does not rule because of God, who rules only as long as God allows them to rule and only in the ways that God allows them. Now that should be a massive comfort for us because as Christians in a fallen world that rejects us and that hostility is growing more and more, we should just remember that there is no king against us who is not leashed by the king over all kings. Amen? That's what we have here. This is a God who reigns over everything. Well, let's move now to number three, the next part of this dialogue. Number three, we're going to call this point Habakkuk's great concern again. Habakkuk's great concern again. Because if you were to read, and we'll look at most of it, Habakkuk 1.12 all the way to 2.1, you would find it to be a carbon copy, almost the exact same thing as verses one through four. This has not solved Habakkuk's problem. Uh, he is still greatly vexed by this. Verse 12, he says, wait a second, wait. Are you not from everlasting, O Yahweh, my God, my Holy One? We will not die. You, O Yahweh, have placed them to judge, and you, O Rock, have established them to reprove? Your eyes are too pure to see evil, and you cannot look on trouble. Why do you look on those who deal treacherously? Why are you silent when the wicked are swallowed up? Uh, you know what he's saying? He's going, wait a second. God, the, the Chaldeans, they are worse than us. I just complained to you about unrighteous people thriving and you were telling me that even more wicked people, people that are, that are greater in their wickedness, are going to devour the righteous. God, help me make sense of this. I don't understand. You see the similarity. In verse 9, oh, sorry, he, he talks about their violence that's being done, uh, just like he did in verse 2 about the violence that's being done. In verse 3, he talked about God looking upon evil. In verse 13, why are you still looking upon evil? Verse 4, he talks about wickedness. Again, these wicked people are swallowing up those more righteous than they. I mean, Habakkuk knows who the Babylonians are. He goes into this description of them. Verse 14, he says, You have made men like the fish of the sea, like creeping things without a ruler over them. The Chaldeans bring all of them up with a hook, drag them away with their net, and gather them together in their fishing net. Therefore, they are glad and rejoice. They offer a sacrifice to their net and burn incense to their fishing net. Because though these things, oh, sorry, th through these things, their portion is rich and their food is fat, will they therefore empty their net and continually kill nations without sparing? God goes, how, or Habakkuk says, how are you letting these people thrive? They're like fishermen at a fish hatchery. Or there's just not much fishing that needs to happen. The fish are just there. And they're just pulling them up with their net and slaughtering the nations and then worshiping the net for their strength. And how long are you going to let these people do what they do? One of the issues we have to deal with is sovereignty and sin. How do we reconcile God's sovereignty and sin? Psalm 115.3 says, Our God is in the heavens. 
He does whatever he pleases. There's nothing that happens in this world that does not happen according to God's will and God's plan. But when evil happens, sometimes we feel like we might need to get God off the hook. Sometimes we feel like we need to explain it away, or he didn't know, or we need to come up with some way that he's sovereign, but not all the time. So let's be really, really clear. God is holy. Beckett says that, verse 13, your eyes are too pure to see evil and you cannot look on trouble. I'll give you a few verses that highlight this. James 1.13 says, let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil and he himself tempts no one. God is not tempted, he does not tempt. He cannot sin. 1 John 1.5 says, this is the message we have heard from him and proclaimed to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. That's 1 John 1, 5. There's no darkness in God. Psalm 5, 4. For you are not a God who delights in wickedness. Evil may not dwell with you. So God does not do evil. There's no evil in him. There's no def defect in him. He's not a deceiver. He is good. But there are passages that discuss God's sovereign reign even over evil and how he allows and uses, and even you could say purposes, evil to accomplish his aims. I got four passages I could show you. I'm gonna show you two of them. Let's turn, if you would, to 1 Samuel chapter two. 1 Samuel chapter two. We have to understand this, because things are going to get worse, and evil is only going to continue in our society. This is not this is not ending with young children being pressured into changing their gender identity and getting surgery for it. This is not ending anytime soon. This is going to come. So we need to understand and continue how, to, to know how we can have faith in God even while evil surrounds us. So 1 Samuel chapter 2, uh, th this is the scene here is you have Eli who's sort of the last judge who's, who's ruling over Israel, who's, who's leading the people of Israel before we get to the first king, which is King Saul. 1 Samuel chapter 2, uh, let's look at verse 22. It says, now Eli was very old, which means you've got to be old when the Bible says you're old. And, and he heard all that his sons were doing. Eli had these sons, Hophni and Phinehas, who were doing awful things. First of all, um, the best meat and the sacrifices were supposed to be devoted to the Lord. Um, was the idea you give your best to the Lord. Just like, by the way, for us, like we give our best to the Lord, not just what's convenient or what we fit in our schedule. Uh, we give our best. They were not doing that. The, they were taking the best meat for themselves and eating it. And they were sleeping with the women who worked at the temple. So this is a, this is a bad scene. And Eli hears what his sons are doing and how they lay with women who served at the doorway of the tent of meeting. And so Eli said to them, why do you do such things? The evil things that I hear from all these people. No, my sons, for the report is not good, which I hear the people of Yahweh passing about. They're doing bad things, and their dad warns them. If one man sins against another, God will mediate for him. But if a man sins against Yahweh, who can pray for him? Now notice, this is, this is not me saying this. This is the Bible. Notice. But they would not listen to the voice of their father. For Yahweh desired to put them to death. See, there's all sorts of things that are going to happen through the death of Eli and pointing to the need for the king and pointing to the power of God. But Hophni and Phinehas continued in their evil ways according to the purposes of God. You could read later 1 Kings chapter 12 about Rehoboam, whose wicked actions divided the kingdom who listened to the, the foolish counsel uh, of people his own age instead of seeking out the wise counsel of those older than him. Why does he do it in 1 Kings 12? Because it was a thing from Yahweh. It was a thing from the Lord. Go, if you would, to Genesis 50. Again, this is not God sinning. God does not sin. He does not cause people to sin. But in his sovereignty, he allows sinful people to carry out their desires for his own purposes. Genesis 50, verse 20. Now, Genesis 50, many of you are aware of, of this. This is the end of the Joseph story. 
Remember, Joseph had a sick jacket and was bragging about it, and his brothers say, let's sell this guy. Well, first they said, let's kill him. Then they said, let's sell him. Anyway, all of this stuff happened, and the end result is that Israel was uh, delivered. They got to be in Egypt and be rescued during a time of famine. Now, notice this is while he's talking to his brothers, and notice the language that's here. Genesis 50, 20. As for you, you meant evil against me, but God used it for good. Is that what it says? Does it say, you meant it, you intended it, you wanted to do it, this was your plan, but God said, Ooh, okay, I'll just kind of flip it around. No, it's the same word. You meant it, you intended this to happen, but God also intended it for happen. Now, you intended this for evil, but God intended it, willed it. It was his desire, his plan to bring it about. Now, it was purposed for good, but God intended it to happen. So we see there in Genesis 50. So let's, let's think about this theologically. Let's think about what this means. God is not the initiator of evil. God does not sin. He does nothing wrong, but he ordains all things. Whether he causes things to happen or he allows things to happen, he ordains all things to happen. All of it comes under his will, even evil. A couple of commentators on, these, on this, Bavink says, God does not will sin. He is far from iniquity. He forbids it and punishes it severely, yet it exists and is subject to his rule. Another author, last name Christensen, who wrote a book on God and evil, says he does not purpose evil for evil's sake. While the Almighty does not do evil, he ordains even the worst manifestations of it to take place. You might think, okay, that's a good explanation. That doesn't give me much comfort. Oh, I think it should, Christian. I think it totally should. Listen to Edwards. Edwards says, the good and evil which happens in God's world should be ordered, regulated, bounded, and determined by the good pleasure of an infinitely wise being. So here's the point. What's better? To look at the world and see evil that you cannot deny and say, it's completely unbound not controlled by anyone, we have no idea what's gonna happen, or to rest and say, look, I don't understand why evil always happens, but I know it's under the control of a supremely good being. So it's a good thing for us, it's a comfort for us, that though we do not understand why, and why it doesn't make sense in our head to know that God reigns over it. We need to keep moving because we have a whole chapter to tackle. But we'll go through it quick. I, I just want to answer, look at one other thing with this. We do not always get to know why God allows horrible things to happen to children, horrible things to happen to nations, to women. We don't know. But we do know it's not because he's not good. And it's not because he's not loving. Because think about this, Acts 4, 27, 28. For truly in this city were gathered together against your holy servants, Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the people of Israel. Listen, truly, God, against your servant Jesus, all these people were gathered against your son Jesus to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. And so we take this, and we take this concern and we go to the cross and say, I don't understand why every act of evil happens. But I do know that God orchestrated evil to happen to Jesus in order to pay for the evil that exists in my own heart. I do know that the evil that I see from my own sin was paid for according to the sovereign plan of the Lord. That Christ paid for my sin in an act of evil because I was evil and needed to be rescued. In fact, friends, you, you could jot this verse down later, Luke 13. Luke 13, people come to Jesus and they're like, hey, did you hear about those uh, uh, Galileans that, that Pilate murdered when they were offering sacrifices? 
Did you hear about that tower that fell on those 18 people and they died? What do you think about that? And you know what Jesus says? He says, unless you repent, you'll likewise perish. Hey, you see those horrible things that happen? That's just a picture of what's going to happen because of your own sin if you don't repent. And I think a fair question for us to ask is when we see these sorts of things on TV or we hear about them on social media, are we more worked up about them than we are our own sin? Because then we'll never understand this issue. Unless when we see those things, we go, man, that's just a picture of how evil I am. And yet God allowed evil to happen to his son so that an evil sinner like me could be rescued and permanently under his love. Habakkuk 2.1. Habakkuk 2.1. Habakkuk responds, he concludes by saying, I will stand on my guard post, station myself on the fortification. I, I, I will keep watch to see what he will speak to me. And I may respond when I am reproved. He says, God, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stand here and trust you. I, I'm ready to be corrected, but I want to hear an answer for you, and I'm going to trust what you tell me. You know what's good for us? God gives answers. God gives answers. Point number four, Yahweh's final response. Yahweh's final response. This is chapter 2, verse 2, all the way to verse 20. We will not be able to look at this. And this point, if you're someone who likes subpoints, this is like a Russian nesting doll of points. There's like a two baby points, and that third point has all sorts of points in it. But, but we'll go quick, I promise. I won't, I won't give you all the, the nitty-gritty. Uh, let's, let's look at this here. What do we see here? What are, God gives two answers. He gives two answers to, to Habakkuk's second uh, sort of complaint. The first one is he's, he reasserts that there's certain destruction. There's certain destruction. Verse 2, Yahweh had answered me and said, write down the vision, write it on tablets distinctly, that the one who reads it may run. For the vision is yet for the appointed time. It pants towards its end. It will not lie, though it tarries. Wait for it, for it will certainly come. It will not delay. Judgment is still coming. I have spoken. It's going to happen. And it did come. 586 B.C., the Babylonians did come, ran, sacked Jerusalem, slaughtered most of them, brought many of them into captivity. But the second thing he tells them is to live by faith. He tells them to respond rightly. Now there is a way to respond to judgment. Verse four, for behold, as for the proud one, his soul is not right within him. So there is a sort of pride that stays vexed there's a pride that says, I see these problems, and I don't think I've been given a suitable enough explanation, so I need to keep searching. I'm going to keep being bothered by this. That's arrogance that says, I need an answer. There's also sort of throw caution to the wind, we're going to die, so I guess I might as well just party it up if there's unrestrained evil. Verse 5, and indeed, wine betrays the haughty man. Uh, so that he does not stay at home. This is, again, there's a, a prideful response uh, in needing answers. There's a prideful response that says, I guess I'll just party it up since I don't know the right way to think about this. But what he tells us there in verse two, or sorry, verse four, is he says, but the righteous will live by his faith. The righteous will live by his faith. Now, faith it's not just belief, you know this. Faith is trust. It's to cling to. It's to hold fast to what God has promised. Or it's to, to lean on. I'm, I'm hearing this, and so I'm putting all my weight into this. I'm, I'm entrusting my life to this reality. And what's interesting is in the New Testament, this passage is quoted twice in two very famous situations. Romans 1.17 and Galatians 3.11. Uh, that is, that we're supposed to have faith in the finished work of Jesus. That's how we're saved. Uh, we're rescued by, by hearing the good news that Jesus has died for our sins. We cannot save ourselves. And so we entrust, we don't just believe that Jesus died for our sins, but we lean into, we entrust our whole life to Christ, clinging to his promises. That's what it means by faith. But here, this faith is about trusting in the promises of God. It's trusting in God's character and what he has told us. By the way, that's the way we are justified. That's why Genesis 15, 6 says, Abraham believed God and to him it was counted as righteousness. 
If you want to live rightly in God's sight, you entrust your life to what God has revealed about his character and about his promises. So here he says, you want to respond to these things, Habakkuk, by faith. Hey, when you see these things happening in the world, student, respond in faith. Well, faith in what? Faith in what? What should I have faith in? Three, three things. I told you, nesting doll. So here we go. Three things to have faith in here. And that's what he's answering in the rest of these verses in 6 through 20. Faith in what? Faith in eventual judgment. Faith in eventual In fact, I might even word that differently. Faith in eventual justice. That might be a better word. What God begins to do is give out these woes. Verse 6 says, Will not uh, of these lift up a taunt song against him, even satire or riddles against him, and say, Woe to him who increases what is not his. For how long? And makes himself rich with loans. Woe to him who takes advantage of people financially in order to uh, raise their own wealth. Verse 9, woe to him who is greedy for evil gain for his house, to put his nest on high, to be delivered from the hand of evil. Verse 12, woe to him who builds a city with bloodshed and founds a town with injustice. We have a woe against greed. We have a woe against oppression. Verse 15, woe to you who make your neighbors drink, who mix in your venom even to make them drunk so as to look on their nakedness. Woe and shaming and pulling others into sin. And finally, verse 19, woe to him who says to a piece of wood, awake and to a mute stone, arise. He says, woe to idolaters. He's covering all sorts of this, robbing others, abusing others, greed, uh, pushing others into sin, idolatry. Woe to them, woe to them, woe to them. Judgment is coming upon them. And what's interesting is how this judgment comes. It comes in several ways. It, uh, and first of all, it's interesting, it comes as, a lot of these, you can look at this up later, come as reversals. Like God is a God of justice, he's also a God of poetic justice. So some of you love the book of Esther because it's funny that Haman uh, builds uh, this device to kill somebody and is then killed in his own gallows. That's funny. There's humor a little bit in the fact that God tries to drown the newborn, or sorry, that Pharaoh tries to drown the newborns of Israel and finds his army drowned in the Red Sea. He's a God of poetic justice. It's, it's kind of funny the way he works. And here you see, woe to you who increase in wealth. Well, verse 8, you'll be taken as spoil. He, he, it's over and over again. He does this. You know what's interesting about this? Notice who these woes are against. Like the first one seems to be against the Babylonians. But, but he doesn't keep repeating their name. You know why that is? It's, it's because God does not show partiality for his judgment. These woes are against all who disobey him. Whether it be the Babylonians who are coming or the Israelites who do not obey his law in Jerusalem. Yeah, God doesn't show favoritism when it comes to judgment. He will judge all who oppose him. And so what he's telling Habakkuk and what he's telling us to believe is that God is going to judge. One day, he is going to judge. It may not happen in the timing we think it should happen. It might be tomorrow it might happen privately, it might happen on a global scale, but all sinners who rebel against God will be judged. So he says, it's going to happen. And so we have faith in this world. As we see injustice and we know every wrong needs to be righted, we know God's going to do that one day. God will do that one day. It might not be in the time that we think but he will have his day of judgment. God is promising judgment is coming. Friend, we need to understand that. We need to know when God says that, he means it. I don't know if in our culture we really believe judgment is coming. I don't know if your unsaved friends that you share the gospel with, which I'm assuming you're regularly sharing the gospel with unsaved people because you don't want them to perish, 
I, I don't know if they believe you when judgment is coming, because think about our culture, right? Th- think about if you go back to your high school days, I mean, think about late assignments and how often a student is supposed to receive an F in class. But then a parent writes a letter or administration gets involved and they go, ah, we'll let them pass. Or someone gets a speeding ticket and, uh, and they're supposed to get the ticket and they, they find a way to talk themselves out of it. But there's all sorts of big threats, consequences are coming and either a parent or just talking nice, oh, okay, I guess we'll let you out of it. Some of you, there, there's the phrase helicopter parents. You maybe experienced a parent rescuing you out of any danger. Last minute, wrote you a note that you didn't deserve. Yet God is not like that. It would be against his character to be like that. He is a God who is going to judge. He means what he says. It would be un Yahweh-ish of him not to do that. Friend, I would say if you're here, even at a master's university chapel, and you're not a Christian, do not presume that God will let you off by being a, well, at least a better sinner than others, at least a more theologically informed rebel. No, friends, judgment is coming. Whoa, whoa, whoa. And what you might need to do at the end of this year is turn to Christ. Stop, stop looking at the world by comparison and saying, at least I'm better than them. And look to God who has called you to holiness. He has given you his son. We're supposed to believe in these, this future justice. The second thing we're supposed to believe in is future rule. Look at verse 14. God says, for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of Yahweh as the waters cover the sea. When we think about elementary school age children being killed, we should be horrified. We should ask questions. And we should trust the Lord. What should we should trust is that one day all sin is gone. And it's not just gone because God's going to make it better. One day, God is going to rule. And the knowledge of him, the knowledge of his glory, is going to fill this earth. And in every place on this earth, Jesus' name will be heralded. And as we just sang, behold, our God will live with us. We sang before, maybe you're familiar with the hymn, this is my Father's world. Uh, The battle is not done, right? It says that though the wrong is off so strong, God is the ruler yet. This is my Father's world. The battle is not done. Jesus who died shall be satisfied and earth and heaven will be one. Christ is coming to reign one day and he will make this world perfect and radiate with his glory. And we trust in that and believe in that. And though we have so many questions about the whys of right now, we know how the story ends. And so we take courage and remain joyful and know in the end we're getting far better than we deserve. And finally, what do we trust in? We trust in this future justice. We trust in his future rule. And we trust that he rules right now. He rules right now. Verse 20. But Yahweh is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before him. Yahweh is in his temple. That is right now, God reigns. Hey, even though this thing happened, I know God reigns. Even though things are going in this direction, I know God is still in charge. I know he is not lessened in his sovereignty. I know his kingship is still established. I know he reigns. I have faith in that. But here's the question. What kind of faith is this? Do you notice It's a silent faith. You see, whenever these sorts of acts of evil happen, there is so much talk 
in so much chatter and speculation and blaming and trying to find the source of the problem and so much posting and reposting and reposting the repost. And we as Christians can get into the same game. And what we need to do sometimes, instead of, saying, instead of trying to say, oh, it's because of this, or oh, it's because of this, or oh, it's because of this, is just be quiet. And know, God reigns. I know for a fact he is good because he had his son die for my sin. I know how it ends. And I will trust him. I will trust him. The future is uncertain. Evil, I don't understand. But this much is, a, is certain. The Lord loves me. He gave his son to die for my sins. He's going to, it is his good pleasure to give me the kingdom. And I will quietly trust him. In a world, in a world of evil friends, let us trust our God who has dealt with us far better than we deserve. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we confess these are weighty issues. We confess we do not always understand why. But we confess, Lord, that sometimes we are arrogant to think that we deserve to know why. Lord, we confess sometimes when, when these things happen, we, we become so judgmental and so enraged at other acts of evil while, while we're so passive to the evil that exists in our own heart. Lord, help us to trust you. Help us to never doubt that you're in control. And as we think of Christ, help us to never forget how good you are to us. Lord, we long for the day, we long for the day when the knowledge of you, when the knowledge of your glory covers this earth, when you for eternity receive the praise due your name. We long for that day, Lord. Until then, help us to silently trust you. We praise you, we love you. To Christ's name we pray, amen.